Hi everybody, my name is Dr. Annette Bosworth and I'm back today to talk a lot more about ketones. Today I'm gonna to tell a story about how I got curious about the ketogenic diet. This happened actually in 2015 and it has kind of a winding tail, but I think it's worth telling. I have patients show up and ask, why do I have such a tough time finding a doctor who wants to talk about ketones or wants to be open to the ketogenic diet? And I will admit, I was just as resistant. It took a huge time suck on why I missed the boat on ketogenic diets and the use I could have been using as an internal medicine doctor for the last 15 years. And then to get up to speed efficient enough to go back out in the world of expert advice and be able to talk uh, with a level of confidence. I get a patient who comes to me and asks me questions about a ketogenic diet. And she used the word ketosis, and instantly my mind heard ketoacidosis. And this happens to a lot of physicians. In medical school, we're like scarred with the word ketoacidosis. If that word comes along, we know the patient is in serious danger. There is a very specific set of rules that we're supposed to follow to get the patient back on track, and time is valuable. So it's almost like a traumatic word to hear the word ketoacidosis as an internist. So when the patient said ketosis, bam, my mind heard ketoacidosis. And I'm not the only one. We get tested on this way too many times as a medical student and not nearly enough time spent on nutritional ketosis and the benefits. So let's go back to this patient and she was nervous to talk to me about this. She mentioned it in a hushed voice that she was at MD Anderson visiting her mother when they put her into ketosis before they would do radiation for her brain tumor. And I just stared at her <laughs> like, I can hardly process the words you're saying to me. She then goes on to explain that uh, her mom has had a tumor called glioblastoma, a very dangerous brain tumor. But her mom is lucky enough to live very close to MD Anderson, which is world renowned on how it takes care of cancer. Uh, let me just make an analogy. If you're the queen of England and you get one of the bad boys for cancer, I'm talking the cancers that within six months people die. I don't care if you're the queen of England, within six months you die. You might have Mayo Clinic on your speed dial, but they're still gonna call MD Anderson. MD Anderson is the mecca for cancer treatment. They are known for this and they do lead the way on finding a way to rid the world of cancer. So if they're putting a patient into ketosis, I couldn't just say, oh, that's a bunch of hogwash. I needed to pause and then I sent a message off to my researcher saying, can you look up why MD Anderson and ketosis might have anything to do with one another? Of course, that's when I got a quick flash uh, briefing on ketosis is a nutritional state where your body feeds off of fat. And that led to a better understanding that when cancer patients are being treated, the cancer cell doesn't know how to use a ketone. A cancer cell can't adapt to a place that has no glucose and lives only on ketones. It must be fueled with Glucose. It wasn't long after I started looking into ketones that my researcher filled my inbox with a recent study that had been done by the Department of Defense. And I thought, what in the world would the Department of Defense be looking at ketones for? So that curiosity led me down another paper trail of Navy SEALs being studied about their performance while in ketosis. Um, it turns out this is really important to a Navy SEAL, and initially I thought the fuel and the way their body's being fueled must have an enhanced performance, and although that's true, that's not why they started looking at that. It turns out that if you're a Navy SEAL, um, they do bragging rights for a few things. One is, how long can you hold your breath? And that sounds strange, but they'll go to a swimming pool and go underwater and say, how long can you hold your breath? And it's kind of like a, you know, alpha male thing or something. But more importantly, they use a special kind of a rebreather when they're scuba diving. Their scuba diving equipment doesn't leave a trail of bubbles. 
And that's pretty important because they're all about stealth and being sneaky and not being able to have the enemy see where you're at. So if you're underwater, um, leaving a trail of bubbles would be like deadly. And so they're using this non-rebreather only to find out that the longer they were on the non-rebreather, the more uh, chemistry shift happened in their brain that induced a seizure. So seizures are something that I've looked at a lot at. I have patients who've suffered many seizures and they have a brain damage. They have had trauma to their brain because of those seizures. And the more seizures they have, the more damage we see. We don't want patients having seizures and we go to extreme lengths to make sure that that stops immediately. So there's probably only one thing worse than having a seizure and that's having a seizure 30 feet under the water because now you're going to drown. Um, seizures are deadly in and of themselves, but even more when you're underwater. So the Navy SEAL team, the Department of Defense, um, worked together to say, how can we prevent these seizures? And they did the same thing that we as physicians did. They added anti-seizure medications. This didn't work out so well. Uh, Navy SEALs are very competitive and their life depends on their reaction time. So our seizure drugs work intentionally to slow down a message as it marches through the brain. When seizures are studied electronically or uh, on a microscopic level, they send messages to one another without regulation. They just kind of, the message becomes like an electrical storm, if you would, in the brain. Using some of our seizure medications will slow down those messages, and that's how we prevent seizures. But what happened with the Navy SEALs is, well, we made them stupid. And I know that's not the word to use, but we just slowed down their thinking, we slowed down their reaction time, and yeah, they wouldn't take that medication. <laughs> They're Navy SEALs because they care about that. So this was unacceptable. They couldn't have their cognition that slow. So the next thing that the uh, team looked into is they found a diet that had been around for many years. And in fact, it was the only lesson about ketosis that I got when I was in medical school was I remember hearing about this diet where they would admit the whole family into the hospital and they would have to teach the family how to get this kid into ketosis. And these are called the ketosis kids because they had childhood seizures and these were the kids that didn't respond to our medications. So here you have the unfortunate event of having childhood seizures. You get put on the medications that are supposed to take them away and then they don't work. Now we have your whole family admitted to the hospital in the 1950s and 60s to make sure we could induce ketosis and that the kid would stay there and that the family understood the rules. So now you march these kids out into their life and they were really compliant. These ketosis kids had um, you know, seizures whenever they stopped following the diet. So they got into ketosis, they stayed in ketosis, and it only took a couple of you know, mistakes in life to fall off of the wagon, if you would, for ketones before they said, no, I can't do that. I end up with a seizure. So let's recap. I first started out with MD Anderson and how their protocol was to put patients on a ketogenic diet. This led to the Department of Defense and Navy SEALs using a ketosis diet to prevent seizures. And then the third layer of my curiosity was from autopsies. And it came from these ketosis kids who got put into that ketogenic state as a child because of their childhood seizures. And now they were dying. They're in their 80s uh, and they're dying. And that's not from seizures. They're dying from other things. But what we were privileged with is a look at their brain autopsies. Let me remind you that seizures don't do nice things to brains. If you want to see the worst brains possible, take a look at the autopsies from folks who've had seizures, especially if they started as a kid, maybe they had dozens or even hundreds of seizures a day. The pattern that the brain looks like in a seizure patient looks very similar to the same pattern I see in drug abusers. Both brains have had chronic swelling from that, one from a chemical and one from uh, the, the short circuiting that happens in a seizure, but they are very riddled with lots of areas of damage, lots of places where we can see plaques that have built up over time. Again, linking both of these to chronic inflammation. 
But what happened with these ketosis kids is you'd followed their brains all the way to the end of their life, and we got the privilege of looking at their brains at autopsy, and I had brain envy. And that's not supposed to happen with a seizure patient. Their brains were pristine. Not only did they not have the chronic damage, but the size of their brains was preserved. So now we had several layers of evidence that had made me curious enough to say, time out, I need to pause my clinic. Yeah, doctors don't do that. That costs a lot of money. For a doctor to sit still and just study something is probably why many physicians are saying, if I can't get my education uh, in a continuing med medical education class, or if I can't get it spoon fed to me where I get you know, points for my education, my continuing education, uh, it's not gonna happen. So here I was reading through this trickle of information, deciding that it was serious enough that I didn't understand this, that I would close my clinic until I figured it out. Not only was this information very curious to me, it was coming from pretty amazing sources. We had MD Anderson, we had Department of Defense, not known for taking like big pharma money to study something, pretty, pretty trustworthy when it comes to research. So let me summarize this up. This video was to show you why you might be struggling to find a physician that's taken time to learn about this. I would contend you're gonna have more and more physicians better educated on this as we get more research on this and it becomes part of the continuing education. Uh, but when I got curious about this, there were three amazing resources that taught me I should slow down and pay attention. One was the message of what was coming from MD Anderson. Number two was the Department of Defense and what they were studying with some of the most amazing athletes in our uh, military. And finally, it was autopsy studies. Like there's hardly anything better for an internist to learn from than watching what happens throughout a lifetime of an intervention and then being able to study it on a cellular level after they've died. Three very reputable ways to learn information and it caused such a curiosity in me that I paused my clinic until I figured this out. So thanks for tuning in. I hope you enjoyed why I got so curious about this and what switched my practice into a full ketogenic practice. Until next time, tune in for more ketosis lessons on the next go around. If you wanna know more about the ketogenic diet, check out my book uh, any way you can, either in audible version, in paperback, or in Kindle. Until next time.